There's always been someone that God has raised up to be a voice crying in the wilderness to America, and I believe we have such a man with us today. So without any further delay, I would like you to give a warm welcome to a man I greatly admire and respect and love to hear preach, Pastor Jack Hibbs. Love you. Too kind. Too kind. Let's all stand for a moment, would you? <laughs> let's pray. And let's pray that, uh, that the sound works okay, right? It's worked fine all day until Amir gets up there. <laughs> Father, we pray right now, Lord, that you prepare our hearts to wrap all this up. A lot of information, a lot of scripture, a lot of, to consider. We also pray, Father, that you would anoint this sound system. We, I'm convinced it's why, Jesus, you didn't use it. <laughs> but, Lord, uh, this is all we have. So we ask you, Father, to multiply the hearing of this. And uh, we ask you now for your presence in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So you can be seated. And uh, I set my timer, and I'm going to be faithful to my time. So when the alarm goes off... Uh, and it will go off if I got this set right. I'm going to want you to be thinking about how um, in, the last six, in the next 60 minutes, will it matter to you? Will you have been brought any closer to the kingdom of God? Now, look, I don't want to uh, neglect the fact that even though this is a prophecy conference, there may be some of you that are here today. You don't know Jesus. Maybe you were invited by someone. What's the reality of all this? You know, for most of us who have been raised in Bible prophecy, everything we heard today... We just nod and like, mm-hmm, write that down. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And hey, that's a great, that's a great insight on that, right? Some of you may be here today, and you're not, you're not exactly sure what you're hearing. It may be that some of you are here today, and it's like, what planet have I been on for the last few hours? And it's my desire, it's our desire, that every one of us who are hearing these things experience exactly what Amir was talking about, and that is your entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And so I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 25. I love the fact I'm going to read this parable that Jesus gave, Matthew 25. None of the speakers have compared notes today. And I have to say that in light of what Amir just said a moment ago. And uh, the brother, Usher, leaned over and said, that's confirmation to you, Pastor Jack. And it is. And that means it's confirmation to us. Matthew chapter 25 Jesus is speaking, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Verse 6. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then those ten virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, No, lest there should be not enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in. Mark that, church, please. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And afterward, other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Now, notice what the determinant factor is. Verse 13, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. The prerequisite for those getting into the kingdom is that they were watching at the critical hour. They had maintained their personal lives and relationships with Christ, with the Master, so that they had enough oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, a life that is driven by the Word of God because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Listen, the last thing the church needs today is another theologian. What the church needs today is spirit-filled oil-filled, if I can put it that way, believers. 
believers who are on fire and fearless and could care less about the opinions of the world. That they only care about the opinion of one, and that is the master in whom is coming. And we are to be ready. So today we're going to be ending this conference with what I'm entitling, what's the big deal about Bible prophecy? What about all this stuff that we've heard? And so by way of preparation, we're going to go through three things today. It's going to feel like ten, but it'll only be three things. But in preparation for that, I'm going to ask you to hold up your Bible. Can you hold your Bible up high, please? By the way, this is a photo op moment. Hold your Bible up high. Some of you have your electronic devices. That's fine, but go out and buy a real leather Bible. But that's okay. <laughs> it's all right. It's just awesome to have. This Bible that you're holding in your hand is unlike any other book in the history of mankind. You need to know that. The Bible of itself. Listen, because I'm thinking with critic in the audience today. The Bible says of itself in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You might say, well, that's meaningless because the Bible says it of itself. No, I'd ask you to take notice of that. The Bible says of itself that it is inspired by God. That means you can test it. Secondly, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, says the scripture, which you do well to take heed to as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's your Bible. You just held up the greatest communication that is ever given to mankind. It's not Facebook, it's not Twitter, it's not Instagram, it's not email, it's not the internet, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. No matter what technology ever brings, it will not be the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. It has endured throughout the ages. It shall endure. It will never go away. It will only be fulfilled, Jesus promised. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, and I love this. Listen, any of you have uh, young kids in college or seminary, listen up. Because a lot of schools these days are teaching your kids in Christian seminaries that we don't need to hear from the Old Testament anymore. Jan mentioned about that. I was talking to Dr. Ed Heinsohn of Liberty University earlier this week, and he said it's true. They're dealing with kids coming to Liberty from churches, and they don't believe in the Old Testament. Let's remember what Jesus had when he preached. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, that is one comma for us or one hyphen for us, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Church family, Genesis to Malachi is ordained and inspired by God. It is the entire word of God. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning. Listen to what John says. I love this. That which was from the beginning, that means when the beginning happened, this one was there. Which we have heard, John is saying, we heard him talk. That which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. Can you imagine touching Jesus? Someday you will. Concerning the word of life, and that life was manifested. That God was revealed in this world, in the person of Jesus Christ, God in flesh. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. This is introduction. Are you taking notes? I hope you're writing this down. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 says, For the testimony of Jesus, that is his word, is the spirit of prophecy. Bible prophecy. The word of God going forth. And so today is obviously a day regarding that parable that we cannot unpack that parable of the ten virgins in the brief time that we have together. That would take weeks because it is so convicting and so important. But I would say this, that the very point of the parable is, I believe, the closeout of this conference. And that is, why are all the things that we've listened to today relevant in my life? How could these things matter to me? And I want to argue with you today, number one, that they do matter for this reason. Point number one today is that the Bible is the only prophetic book there is. Period. I'm not being mean by saying this. I'm not being dogmatic. 
I'm not being myopic. I'm announcing to you that of all the religious writings of all the world of all time, there's only one prophetic book that man has available to him, and that is the Bible. You may be here today or you may be watching right now from an Islamic nation and you're saying, no, 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 we have the Quran. No, 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 you do not. The Quran is a book of copies. The Quran came much later. Islam is relatively new. The authorship of the Quran, whatever prophetic claims they pretend to have are those that are vaguely lifted from the Bible and changed. There's no origin of prophetic eschatological truth in the Quran. What about the Book of Mormon? Great Mormon people are wonderful. I love them. They're wonderful people. By the way, if we worked as hard as Mormons do, I think we'd be out of here a lot sooner. <laughs> we could hasten the day of the Lord's return by getting busy, but the bummer is the Mormons have got the wrong Jesus, and I love my Mormon friends. But their Jesus is one of many gods. And the Book of Mormon has no prophecies. And you can go down the list of Hinduism, Buddhism. You can go to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. You can go to all of these things. In fact, isn't it interesting? We just came to the closeout of a year and the embracing now of a new year. And every year, the soothsayers and the uh, charlatans have got their New Year's Day predictions. Everybody's interested in the future, but nobody turns to the Bible. Isn't that weird? That goes to show you that there's a hunger for prophetic things, but people don't want the Bible because that's a little bit too deep. I'm afraid that God might require something of me. Oh, he does. He requires that you and I follow him and that we give our lives to him and that we be busy about our father's business and that we be making the word of God preeminent more than anything else in our lives and that the world out there would be beating down the door to get into our churches instead of the churches trying to make themselves look more like the world. We've got, the best, we've got the best message in town, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't get any better than this. And we don't have to apologize for it. We just ought to use it. The Bible's prophetic. The only book in the world. How so? Number one, the Bible's the first book to speak. It's the Bible. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, for example, verse 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in the times past to the fathers, I love that, by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. By the way, you know, uh, when Jesus uh, is the last revelation of God, that means you don't need to run to some prophet down the street to hear the next word from somebody. I'm sorry, am I stepping on some toes? Listen up carefully. God spoke finally through his son, Jesus. That's why the book of Revelation's at the end of your Bible. That's why the one who has the last say, is Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. There's a reason why that book is at the end of your Bible. And you read those letters in red, and then you read Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Jesus has the last word. And that's a fact. And you need to remember that. God has spoken to us. The Bible speaks first. And the Bible again says in Genesis 1.1, we saw it a moment ago, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I love that. God just flat out, draw, it's a mic drop. God walks out onto the scene and says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Boom, drops the mic, walks off the stage. <laughs> you want to know why? Listen, God spoke. You get past Genesis 1, everything in the Bible's downhill. So we've heard about the rapture. The rapture, that's so, that's so mysterious, Genesis 1.1. Get over that one. Everything else is easy. <laughs> I'm serious. Well, how's God going to raise the dead? Listen, I don't know. By his power, for sure. But I'm good after Genesis 1-1. God can do anything he wants. Well, how many days was it? Who cares? Well, was it literal days? Was it 24 hours? Who cares? My God is so awesome, he can do it in 24 nanoseconds. It doesn't matter. He says it, he does it. How big is your God? How big is your God? It sounds like the Bee Gees should sing that one. How big is your God? How big is your God? Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Genesis 2, 16 says, The Lord God commanded that man, uh, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Not only to surely die, but Adam and Eve. Uh, everybody dies. Everybody dies. Why? God said it, 
And I want to ask you right now, even if you're an atheist right now and you're here, is man dying? Amir so well said a moment ago, look at a picture of yourself 20 years ago. I don't have to look at a picture of myself 20 years ago. All I have to do, or what I did this morning, was try to get out of bed. <laughs> and I'm aged. But as a believer, I'm excited. I put more cologne on this morning. It used to be where I used to do two pumps. This morning was five pumps. <laughs> Why? I am dying. I'm dying. It takes more to cover up this stink. Why is it true? Listen, atheists, think about it. Second law of thermodynamics. Entropy. We're dying. Everything's going from order to chaos. That's the law of science, and God said it in Genesis. Everything's perfect. You eat this fruit. It's not the fruit, by the way. You know it's not the fruit. It's Apple computer. You know Apple with a bite in it? It's demo it's, we don't know if it was an apple. It's so tempting. It had to be tempting. We're from California. It had to be an avocado. <laughs> Can you say no to an avocado? It's not the fruit. It's that they disobeyed God. God wanted a real meaningful relationship with them. Well, why would God set them up to fall? He didn't set them up to fall. Because God does not create robots. He created Adam and Eve with moral agency. They could pick and choose. By the way, listen, if you're not a believer, you love the fact that you can pick and choose. That's how you have a relationship. If anybody's in a relationship with you and you don't give them the chance to choose, you're a weirdo. You want a real relationship where there's an exchange of feelings and dialogue and relationship. It's vitally important. God did that. And I'm just going to submit to you, God spoke and the evidence is overwhelming. Just be intellectually honest enough to face the music. God's the creator. You were created in the image of God. And as a believer, I should be excited about getting to heaven. I can't believe. I'm sorry. I, look, I can be a little bit extra bold. This is not my church. I'm leaving in a minute. <laughs> I don't understand a Christian who says, oh, I, don't, I don't believe Jesus could come back soon. Wait a minute. It's in the Bible. Yeah, that's your interpretation. Okay, listen, pause. Do you want him to come back any moment? Yes. You know why? The Holy Spirit in you says, come Lord Jesus. If you're a Christian, you're saying, my Lord delays his return. Why would you say that? That's weird. Even if you think Jesus is going to rapture you at the end of the tribulation period, which is really weird. Why? For what purpose? Even if you think that, that's okay, you can think that. Here's the deal. Wouldn't you want him to come back right now? Yes. Now, Amir was talking about Jesus coming back soon, and I've had never had a problem with that, but I, next week's my birthday, and I just found out for my birthday, this, this wonderful gentleman in our church bought me a, um, the, you know what it's called? It's called the Porsche experience. Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> I am going to go to Porsche and, and I get to drive, I get to pick the car and drive it on a racetrack. So now I know the Lord will not be back until after January 15th. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. The only thing better is the rapture. God speaks. Did not God say from the Bible prophetically, this is a prophetic statement, and I will put enmity, warfare, he's speaking to Satan in the garden, between you and the woman, and between your seed, ew, Satan has offspring, think of that, and her seed, capital S, that means Eve is going to have an offspring, that it's going to be, he'll be the savior, who will bruise your head and you will bruise his, uh, he, he will bruise your heel, but you will bruise or crush his head. That is a prophetic statement, church. Say amen. amen. Of your salvation, it is a prophetic announcement. The Bible speaks first. No other book in the world is like this. Secondly, the Bible is a prophetic book because the Bible is the first to cooperate. A good Muslim will tell you, that's why we don't believe in the Bible. 66 books, 40 different authors. That's crazy. They claim we have one author. They actually don't. That's soon to be revealed. Your friend's Muslim world is about to be rocked, ladies and gentlemen. They have discovered from the horrific events of ISIS in the Middle East, you know, God brings good stuff out of bad stuff. Archaeological evidence has now brought forth, by the way, those things are now in the United States, under lock and key, being researched. The most original copies of the Quran, written by four different men, 200 years after the death of Muhammad, and it's dated. And that news is coming out, and it's going to shock the Muslim world. You better get ready to 
to give your Muslim friends the gospel. You better get ready to give your Muslim friends the gospel. The Bible corroborates from Genesis to Revelation. Seamless. Oh, it's so seamless. Amir, listen to this. Where are you? Did you leave? Where are you? Are you right here? Listen to this. Look, you know, the menorah that you hand carried from Israel to our church that's in their foyer, yeah? We had this big menorah. At Christmas service, there was a, a, a couple from our church and they brought a Jewish couple. And they said hi to me. And the, and the Christian couple said, boy, everything you said and I just really nailed the two of them. They're Jews. And, it, and I said, wow, okay. So we started talking, very, very nice man. And I said, oh, how do you like our menorah? He goes, ha, ha, that's not a menorah. You're a Gentile. I knew that's ridiculous. I said, it is a menorah. He said, no, 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 menorah's got nine, nine stems on it. I said, no, it doesn't. He said, yes, it does. I said, no, it doesn't. And look, he's Jewish. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. <laughs> it's fantastic. And you know what he said? He said, no, 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 the menorah is nine. I said, that's funny because God gave to Moses in Exodus and Leviticus that it's seven. And he said, you mean Friday menorah? That's what he called it, a Friday menorah. I said, yes, a Friday menorah. Hanukkah is the nine. Seven is the one in the Bible. So what's my point to this? That from Genesis to Revelation, you could read Genesis to Malachi if you're Jewish, skip all the New Testament and read Revelation, it would make sense to you. Because the menorah that's in the Old Testament, you find the menorah again in the New Testament, book of Revelation. You find the tree of life in the beginning, you find the tree of life at the end. Over and over, it's corroborating evidence given by God. 66 books by 40 authors by, by one origin. God himself. And over that course of time, some of these guys living on separate continents and other realms under, under other kingdoms, nearly a 2,000 year period, and they all agree. Evidence overwhelming, corroborating evidence. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, or excuse me, Isaiah says 46 verse 9 and 10, for I am God, there is no other God. I am God, there is none like me. Say amen. amen. That's your God. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Number three, under this point, the Bible is prophetic because it's the first to promise. The Bible is the first to promise. Bible prophecy ought to lead every person who studies it to a closer relationship to Jesus Christ because the Bible, from cover to cover, promises you a head-on collision regarding one individual. The psalmist, it's echoed again in the book of Hebrews, for behold, in the volume of the book, the Bible says it is written of me. And that's about the person of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 45, verse 21 says, declare what is to be, present it, and let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and, what? Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Isaiah 45 says that. I love that. That sounds like a New Testament verse, doesn't it? Isn't Jesus the Savior? I thought God just said here he's the Savior. Didn't Jesus say to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, listen, before Abraham was, he said to them, ego emi, I am. I am the self-contained, eternal, existing one. That's why they picked up stones to kill him. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> Isaiah 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things, that's the things written down in ancient times, have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Does that sound awesome? Would you not agree with me t today that God is the one who makes the promises, he's the one that has, has speak, is the one who speaks this into us, and God says, I know before I speak them to you, so I'm telling you in advance. Are you sitting down? Mark this verse, John 14, 29. John 14, 29. And now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Do you hear that language, friend? Do you hear that? The remarkable promise that God gives 
that his word is prophetic. Point two in our study today. There's only three, but this is point two. Regarding what's the big idea about Bible prophecy is that the Bible, in its prophetic nature, requires the believer to be watching. You need to write that down. You are required, I am required to keep myself maintained in a state of readiness. I would submit to you today, and I do not take one thing away from those who are being martyred for our Jesus today and have of recent times been beheaded, burned at the stake, or skinned alive. I take nothing from them. I would like to submit to you that one of the most difficult things, if not more difficult than dying, what God's saying to you, I need you to be faithful to my name and to my word and walk with me for the next 48 years, every day, day in and day out. Come and follow me. I would submit to you today that without the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I cannot maintain the state of readiness. We're living in an awesome time. We heard it from Jan and Barry. All of these things are designed under the watchful eye of God, no doubt. But Satan, the Bible says, in the last days, these perilous times would come. For those of you who are craftsmen, the word is uh, to plane, where the wood is being shaved ever so thinly off of the log. And the days are wearing us down. And the Bible says that you're to maintain your light. You're to maintain the oil. Your relationship with the Lord. I know you love Jesus or else you wouldn't be here. But isn't it, get it getting it harder to continue that love relationship with Jesus? Be honest. You've got to work harder to have your devotional time now. Let's be honest. You've got to work harder to pray. It's different than it was 40 years ago when I became a Christian. Many distractions. Many hardships. Listen, I want to encourage you. This is exactly what God knew in advance before he called you into his family. You're going to make it. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You're going to make it, so keep your oil lamp full. But pastor, I feel like I'm failing. We all feel like we're failing. But you're ready. Oh, I didn't witness to enough people. I didn't pray long enough. I didn't give enough. I didn't. None of us have. But are you looking for him? Do you get up every day? Thank God there's new mercies every morning, right? <laughs> Woo! Get up and go again. If some of you, you're, you've, you've been defeated and you're wallowing in your defeat and you hurt Jesus and there's no way back, <coughs> I want you to know that's the voice of the enemy. I want you to know that's the voice of condemnation. I want you to know that only the God of the Bible says, get up. Get up, Joshua, and stand to your feet. He's saying that to you today. Mary, get up. Stand to your feet. Whatever your name is, fill in the blank. Get up. Stand to your feet. I got things to do with you, and I'm not done with you. If God was done with you, you'd be dropping dead today. When he's done with you, you're done. I'm... Look, you can retire, but spiritually, you can never retire. Okay? We're to be watching Luke chapter 21. Okay, I'm going to get excited about this. Up until now, I've been sick and haven't been feeling well. <laughs> Luke 21, I'm going to get excited. This pumps me up. You ready? Luke 21, 34, about watching. Jesus said, be careful because your hearts could be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of this life. Oh, gosh, I'm glad we don't have to deal with that. And that the day will close in on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Listen, I'm going to ask you a question. Be careful how you answer. Christian, do you live on the face of the earth? The Bible says you do not live on the face of the earth. Listen, exactly, brother. Get up here and preach this message. Come on. <laughs> He's right. We are citizens of heaven. This is not our home. We don't dwell here. The book of Ephesians says we dwell in the heavenlies. That's where your address is. Think about that. I just saw the other day. In fact, Jan, I think Jan pointed out today that now, that, you know, Google and YouTube and all these uh, people know, they not only know where you're at, 
but they know more than you probably know about you. And I mean it. I'm not joking. They now know all about your exact spending habits. They know your conversations. They know. Listen, here's a little test. Here's a little test. If you set your phone down, you can turn it off. You set your phone down. Carry on a conversation this evening. And then in the morning, when you go on Google, look on the sidebar and see what's being offered on the sidebar thumbnail clips. And it's regarding the conversation you were having with friends the night before. Dead serious. Check it out. It's listening. It shops. And then it puts up. You know, they say it's trying to help you. I don't need that kind of help. You don't dwell on this earth. Here's the punchline. Verse 36, Luke 21. Be always on the watch. By the way, the word in Greek means scanning. I love it. Be looking. Be looking. Be always on the watch and pray. Pray what? That you may, what's the word? Oh, say it again. What? escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Did you hear that? Did you hear it? The Bible says, pray, watch, be ready so that you can escape the things that are about to happen. You know what that escape is called? Rapture. Harpazo in Greek. Rapture in Latin. Caught up in English. It's in the Bible. There's been raptures in the Old Testament, if you think about it, in miniature. And there's a big one coming. I hope it happens today. Okay, under this watch, we're to be urgent. So number one, we're to be urgent. There should be a sense of urgency about the spirit-filled Christian. If you're not urgent today, you're a lover of Jesus, but you're not urgent. You need to ask God to forgive you, to remove the clutter from your life, and to get you in hot love with Jesus about his return. Just think about it. When you're in love, you're nuts. I love doing weddings. I love tormenting the bridegroom just before the service. <laughs> we always pray. Well, I always get the guys together, and I always say the same thing. It's kind of, this is between us, so don't let anybody know this. But I get the guys together, and I say, okay, first things first. Make sure your zippers are up. It happens every time. <laughs> Secondly, we're going to pray right now for this wedding, but we're going to pray that the Lord comes back even now. Let's pray. And the groom will always go, Pastor, just one night. He, Jesus can come back tomorrow. Why? Because he loves her. Do you love him? Do you long to see him? Enough to be watching? Enough to be pushing stuff off to the side? Listen, the world is sending out to us allurements. Push it off to the side. Distractions, flirtation, temptation. The world gives us opportunities. Watch out. Don't say yes to everything. God may not be in it. Satan's very good about bringing to you and I the opportunity to fulfill that desire that's hidden or secret. Watch out. Be on the guard. Be urgent. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which... Notice the location. Is this awesome? Can you guys see this on the screen? Okay, look at this, look at this verse. Catch this. Circle it in your Bibles. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which, what does that mean? Perspective, our perspective. <laughs> look, it's from up there, looking down here. That's how we look, that's how we're supposed to look. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our vile body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Notice where you live, you're not an earth dweller. But the Bible says that you are to be praying and watching and getting ready and be urgent because he's going to catch us up to where we belong. Could happen at any time. We'll talk more of this in the closing. But that word eagerly wait means to expect with great expectation. It means to be waiting with anticipation. Wow. I love it. Here's my favorite verse. If you get an email from me, it's going to have this verse on it. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's pretty crystal clear. Jesus is God according to that verse. Jesus is my Savior according to that verse. I should be excited and hopeful. I should be watching because I'm to be looking and it's my blessed hope and it's going to be his great glorious appearing. What a great thing. Number two, imminent. Imminent. 
Boy, I tell you, I'm grateful for this conference. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for doing this. Because you know what? I'm going to tell you guys, <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys right now, you go across America, Jan knows, you go, you go mostly around the world, and it's unheard of. You, go, you can go to Christian universities and ask them, does the Bible give you a doctrine of eminency? They won't even know what you're talking about. But Dr. H.A. Ironside knew what, you, knew what you'd be talking about. Dr. John Wolvery would have known what you're talking about. Listen, for that matter, Paul the Apostle would have known what you were talking about, for crying out loud. It means that Christ could come back at any moment for the church. Hey, listen, if you're not a Christian, oh, what, are you going to tell me the world's coming to an end? No, it's not coming to an end. You know, every time there's a war in the Middle East, it's going to happen again soon. CNN's going to call. You have a comment? You have a comment? You have a comment about, is this, the end? Is this Armageddon? Is this Armageddon? Pastor, what do you think? You know, you notice CNN could care less until there's a war and then they want to know what we think and then they always think wrong. Is this the end of the world? No, calm your jets. Calm down. It's not the end of the world. They always get shocked. It's not the end of the world. No, you know what? The rapture could happen at any moment. There's at least seven years ahead of us and then, listen, there's a thousand years after that. So the world's not going to come to an end for at least one million seven years. <laughs> All right, think about it. The millennial, millennial reign of Christ is a thousand years long. A thousand years. And then seven years is a tribulation period. The world's not coming to an end. But dude, don't sit back and rest. Because the rapture could happen to today. There's no precursors to the rapture. Not a one. Don't think, oh, I got, I got, I'm, I'm waiting for this to happen, that to happen, this other thing to happen. Don't do that. I like what Dr. Heinsohn says. He says that he's, he's, not, he's not waiting for the Antichrist. He's waiting for Jesus Christ. He's not waiting for the undertaker. He's waiting for the upper taker. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's a good word. Imminent. The Bible says and teaches eminency, that you're to be always watching. You may not like what I'm saying, but just the parable says to watch and be ready. You don't know when. No warning. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Colossians 3.4. Colossians 3 verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. It's going to happen in a moment. Hey, listen, write this down. The rapture is our blessed hope. Awesome, beautiful, no warning. Global, listen, global, not, not localized. It's, glo it, it's a global event. Watch. It's predominantly Gentile. Some Jew in it, a mere Jew... Marty Getz, Jew. Anybody else Jew in here that's saved? Jew born anew? Anybody? See, that's awesome. One of the ways that we know we're at the end is that the early church was predominantly Jewish and a little bit Gentile. Now the church is predominantly Gentile, a little bit Jewish. But now you're starting to see Jews wake up to the reality of Jesus being the Messiah. What does that mean? Out of, I'm sorry, but out of all the stuff we heard today, when you start hearing that Jews are waking up to Jesus. They're going to be members of the church. They're going to go up in the rapture. But it's also an indicator that once the rapture takes place, God's going to go to work. And listen, it's localized on Israel, okay? And the second coming, every eye shall see him. It's the great and terrible day of the Lord. The Bible says that those who dwell on the earth will mourn and try to hide themselves from him in his return. Listen, and the Bible says in the second coming, we will be with him, Revelation 19, coming out of heaven to come back to the earth. Question, how did we ever get up there? Answer, the rapture. But listen, Jesus is going to come back the second time like he came the first time. The first time he came to the nation of Israel and he came to Jerusalem. The second time he's going to come to the nation of Israel, which has to be in existence, and he has to come to Jerusalem, which has to be in existence. Think of it. One is a blessed, beautiful thing. The other one is he coming in fiery judgment. Read Isaiah 61 in the following verses. It's tremendous. And then also, we're to be prepared. The Bible wants us to be watching, so it's the imminency of Christ's return, and then we need to be prepared, and I love this, prepared. Uh, 1 John 3, verse 2. You guys all know this verse. It's so encouraging. Beloved, now we are the children of God. 
you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Do you believe that he rose again from the dead? Listen to me. I am not saying, I am not saying that you're supposed to do some sort of penance so that you help him out on the cross. I'm not saying that you somehow be good enough to get yourself resurrected from the dead. I'm asking you today, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead for your justification? If you believe that he did it all, then all to him you owe. And let me tell you something. That is a wonderful truth because God says, by putting his Holy Spirit in your life, you're now my child. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Are you prepared to meet him like that? And then finally, we'll end with this. The third and final argument is, what's the big idea about Bible prophecy is this. Why... There is in the Bible a warning of what we heard so much today about deception. Some of the things you heard today were shocking to some of you. And yet, I think if you were to take a microphone, someday we've got to be bold enough to do this. Everyone who's ever been involved in a conference, you can ask these guys and ask Jan later. The best Bible conferences ever don't happen here on the platform. You know where they happen? back there behind that wall. When we sit down and we talk about, did you see, and then regarding Syria, and did you see this thing coming, and did you, what about that? And then, what about that verse? Oh my goodness, I wish all of you could pull up a table. I mean, we need to do that someday. It's just awesome, because it's just awesome. <laughs> oh, by the way, Amir, did you, did you talk about Syria? Did anybody talk about Syria? It has nothing to do with my note. Should I talk about it for a moment? Okay, Barry, you heard the people. Okay. No, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Listen. Um, keep your eye on Syria. It, it really helps the United States... It could help the United States and Israel if Trump pulls the forces out of Syria. So are you kidding me? Oh, it just brings the end closer. It could, but at the same time, you know people. Don't discount the fact that Trump possibly believes that he's got one year left or one term, a one term presidency. That he's not about to live the Middle East, leave the Middle East in turmoil to his grandchildren. He loves Israel, there's no doubt about that. I'm just saying, it's possible that once the United States forces are out, that they'll be replaced with an army that is privatized, that has no answer to Geneva Convention rules, or anything else, and if you've been listening to the Trump the last eight or nine days, he's been saying, listen carefully, go back and watch, he's been saying, we're going to pull out of Syria, but we're really going to let him have it. Did you hear that? He's been saying that. Are you, are you catching it? That statement, in light of friends that you know, and Triple Canopy, and Blackwater, and other private armies in the world, go find out if they're being called up, and if they're being offered up, yeah, jobs. Why? Because what might happen in the area of Syria is something that might be something that only a privatized army can pull off because they don't have to answer to anybody. Just keep that, keep that before your eyes. Regardless, keep your eyes on Syria, period. I mean, I believe uh, outside the rapture, I believe that Damascus could go up any moment. I even think that Damascus and its destruction, according to Isaiah 17, could even preempt Ezekiel battle. It could be that Isaiah 17 triggers the Ezekiel battle. But right now, there's a lot of people living in Damascus, according to Isaiah 17, and I believe it's Jeremiah 49. Is it 49? There's going to come a time when no one will ever again live in Damascus because of its destruction. That's, that was a distraction. Final thing about deception. The Bible gives us warnings. 
And a unique description, by the way, that the last days are going to be days of likened under the days of Noah. We don't even begin to embrace that. When's the last time you read about the days of Noah? My dear friend, it's pretty freaky, you know. The Bible says, Jesus said, I'm going to come back like it was in the days of Noah. You think it's bad right now? The stuff that Jan showed us, those pictures that keep you up at night. That's nothing compared to what's coming. Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 41 into 42, tells us that in the last days, it's going to happen again. It says, they, whoever they are, will mingle with the seed of men. There's things coming, ladies and gentlemen, that maybe it's going to be look, maybe it's going to be spun off as Microsoft. Maybe it's going to be spun off as Google. Maybe it's going to be spun off as DARPA. Maybe, maybe it's going to be spun off as something, some high-tech creation invention. I don't know. But I know this. You know this. Satan's no dummy. And he's already captured children with games. He's already captured a culture. None of us. Look, if somebody robbed me today, they'd be a poor man. You want to know why? I'm cashless. Listen, I have a wife, I have daughters, I don't have any money. I have no cash. I have no cash. It's a cashless society. My life is numbers, ladies and gentlemen. And the Bible says in the end times, the enemy is going to use that. Days of deception. And we love it. Banking without numbers. I don't want to carry cash. Want to stop human trafficking? Really, do you really want to stop sex trafficking? Only one way. Bring in the mark. You want to secure the borders? Bring in the mark. You want to reboot global economies? Do away with them all. Bring in the mark. It's a perfect answer. And we are prime, we are ready. D days of deception. That's it on the very overt. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times or the end of days, some will depart from the faith. Don't let it be you giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Mike McIntosh, we, we were talking about those pictures Jan showed a moment ago. Is it possible that that nine-year-old boy, whatever he was, could he be possessed with a demon to walk like a 21-year-old like a, a on a Hollywood catwalk? How did that happen? What about, what, about her, what about his parents? What about the world we're in? What about the stuff that's happening? I believe that we are deep into already the days of demonic doctrines. And they're in churches. Replacement theology is demonic. Those who say they are of the, that they're Jews. Jesus said to the church at Philadelphia, he commended them. He said, I, I love the fact that you hate those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are liars. Today, replacement theology says, no, no, the church is Israel. That's a demonic doctrine you got to throw your Old Testament away if you're going to embrace that trash. Oh, we don't, we don't recognize the government of Israel. Israel's occupying Palestine. Excuse me? Find Palestine in your Bible. There is no Palestine. It's never been a biblical term. It was, it was slapped upon the land of Israel in 135 AD by Hadrian, the emperor of Rome, to insult the Jews. It's fabricated. You know now more about that than the UN knows. It's a doctrine of demons to deceive. Notice, it's anti-Israel, anti-Jew. That's how the world's going to be in the last days. Why? Satan knows that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back to the Jews. So if Satan thinks I'm going to kill the Jews, then there's no Jew for Jesus to come back to. Thank God Satan's going to lose. That's why Satan wants to rename Jerusalem. That's why he wants to split it. Are you with me? Look, if this offends you, just get your ge geography straight. Don't take it personal. Take it biblically. Jesus Christ is coming back, says the Bible, to the land of Israel, says the Bible, to the city of Jerusalem. Period. Satan doesn't want that to happen. Makes things real clear. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be, here's a promise, prophecy, false teachers among you, who will secretly, that is by stealth, bring in, inject destructive heresies what does that mean? Teachings that are just a little bit off. That's pretty tragic. I'll, fi I'll single two groups out right now, and then we'll end soon. No, I, 
have 11 minutes and 37 seconds. <laughs> There's the mockers and scoffers. Mockers and scoffers. Jude 1, verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken to you by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last days, last times. 2 Peter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first. Wow. That scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust. And this is what they're going to be saying. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they are willingly ignorant. Mockers. I don't believe Jesus could come back today. I don't believe Jesus is coming back. Mockers and scoffers, watch out. Those are doctrines of demons. Well, yeah, but you know what? Pastor so-and-so said, I don't care who he is. I don't care if he's, if he's the Pope. I don't care if he's the priest. I don't care if he's Billy Graham back from the dead. I don't care if it's Mother Teresa. I don't care. I'm trying to think of somebody who's alive. <laughs> um, I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is on this platform. Anybody begins to inject and suggest, I don't think Jesus can go back soon. Listen, personally, I mark him. I, in my head, mm, mm. <laughs> And I'll listen a lot to what they're going to say. Matthew 24, 45, Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Blessed is that servant whom the master, when he comes, find him so doing. Verse 48, But if that evil servant in his heart says, My master delays his coming, notice the result of that doctrine and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and in an hour when he's not aware of. Watch out. The second group is what I call, and I said it a moment ago, the replacement theology camp I just call the fakers and the replacers. There's the scoffers and the mockers, and there's the fakers and the replacers. They say there are Jews and are not. They want to be Jewish. It's so funny. They want to be Jewish until persecution breaks out against the Jew, and then they're not Jewish anymore. And they're the fakers. They're the ones that are saying that the church took the place of Israel. What a devilish doctrine. For more on that, you can look at Revelation 3, 7 through 9. But we look at these three closing things. Jesus said, watch out. Many deceivers are coming. Many, not a few. Church, relatively right now, listen to this. What's coming? Please listen as I close. What's coming? What, we, what we've experienced thus far is nothing compared to what's coming. If, listen, if you are not seated in the Bible, if you're not rooted, there's going to be stuff happening that there's going to be such demonic powers through people who look right and sound right that unless you're grounded in the scriptures, you're going to get swept away. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, Take heed to yourselves, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Can you imagine if your grandchild, I'm a grandparent, so I'm going to pick on having grandkids. I, I thought my life was over until we had grandkids. And now you've got to get back in the fight. But if somebody came along, you know, if, if my daughter said, you know, I'll, I'll, my, our, our grandson went blind. <clears throat> and I heard down the street that there was some religious guy and he's been opening up the eyes of the blind. He's been healing people. They can't walk and now they're walking. And you have a blind grandchild? What would you do? Hear me now. It's coming. Your, your, your grandchild's blind. You want them to see. There's a man down the street in a big gathering. Thousands of people are there. And you've been told that guy's got the power to open up the eyes of the blind. He's done it to three people already just last week. Get your grandbaby down there. But his teaching's a little off on the deity of Jesus. What are you going to do? You see? It's, ha it's going to happen. Can you imagine if that happened in your family? And you held your ground and you said, don't take our grandbaby to that false prophet and the rest of your family sees it differently, moved out of emotions, because they have an emotionally-based theology rather than a biblically-based theology? No, if it feels right, I'm going to do it. And that's how you'll wind up in hell. 
deceivers, many of them. Secondly, there's going to be, they're going to be charismatic. Matthew chapter, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3 says that they're going to come on the scene because people, listen, people will not want to endure sound doctrine. Oh my goodness, listen, I'm almost done. Are we not living in that age now? People don't want sound doctrine. Honestly, with what you've heard today from all of these people, this should have been taught at the Rose Bowl today. No, seriously. The, the amount of scriptures you heard today, if truth was loved in Southern California, this conference should have been held at the Coliseum or the Rose Bowl. There should have been 100,000 people here today. You want to know why? Because it's true. People don't care about true anymore. They don't care. They don't want to know. Just, I want to stick my head in the hole and I don't want to know. Charismatic deceivers, just give me somebody that can really excite me. Give me enough juice on Sunday morning that their enthusiasm will take me through the rest of the week and then I'll get another fix on Sunday morning. Give me a speaker that riles me up and gets me going. Doesn't matter about the content. Doesn't matter who's being glorified. Be, be careful. Woe unto us. When the flocks begin to say, oh, did you hear him? Oh, did you hear him? Oh, what about her? What about them? That's dangerous. These precious speakers up here, you know what? We have, we have, uh, of course, we have a lot of things in common. But you know, I texted Amir while he was talking to you. I, I was back there, and I, and I said, I did. I said, and I said, can you believe, Amir, after all these years that you and I get to do what we're doing right now by his glory, by his grace. Look, I've known, listen, I've known these guys for so long, but listen, when, when Amir and I first met each other, we were just, we, I, we were a little Jack and a little Amir. <laughs> and we were like this. And to see what God has done, but here's what, it's wonderful, but here's the problem. There's so few people anymore that want to hear the truth because feelings are getting in the way, because charismatic deception. Many deceivers, charismatic de deceivers, and then we have the miraculous deceivers. They're going to perform miracles. And so I'm going to end with this. I want to encourage you to keep the faith. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I'm not kidding with what I'm about to tell you. You can get an app now and put it on your Bible, audio Bible. You can listen to it in your car. I'm going to ask you to start listening to the Bible when you wake up, when you go to sleep at night, when you drive in the, when you get stuck on all of these great Southern California parking lots we have called the 91, 405, 5, 71, 91, you name it, 605, 710. It's ridiculous. 105, hate that one, built by Satan, 105. But you know what? Because the days and the roadways are evil, you can redeem the time by turning on the Bible. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Pump it into your head. Pump it. Pump it into your head. The Bible, 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 more Bible. Why? You'll have hope. This book supernaturally will give you hope. This book supernaturally will keep you in power. This power. This book, keep the faith. Stay in it. This book will guarantee fellowship. If you're watching right now, or if you're here right now and you're backslidden, you thought you'd come, good, glad you're here. Stop backsliding. Listen, here's, here, here's, here's how we know you're backsliding. You don't go to church anymore. I don't need to go to church to be saved. No kidding. I'm not going to go to church, a bunch of hypocrites. Join the club. I'm not going to go to church because there's no perfect church. That's why you should attend a church. There's no perfect church. Like you're perfect, you know what? God didn't say, but in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, get to church. You want to know why? Because there's weirdos at church. Let's be honest. We're family. It's true. Did God ask you to love one another or tell you? He told us. Why? He knows us. We're related. That's why we don't get along. We have to work at it. We get along with strangers. It's the church. 
we got a fellowship. Get back to a church now. I don't care what, I do, as long as it's teaching the Bible, get back to it. Find a church, go to it. Make it happen. And then finally, be a witness. You know what? I don't blame the world for walking out on the church. I don't blame the world for laughing at us. You turn on certain Christian television programs, I laugh too. Then I start to cry. Because the world looks at us and says, what a bunch of bozos those Christians are. You know what? I get it. Just for the record, the church never died for anybody. You'll never see a church on a cross. A good friend of mine told me forever ago that his dad taught him, greatest thing you can do in life is to keep your eyes six feet or higher above people. Keep your eyes six feet or above. That's a good word. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because you know what? I Instagrammed last night because we have caterpillars in our house. I know it sounds gross. But we bring them in. Or I, we raise monarch butterflies in our backyard. But you got to have a caterpillar before it turns into a butterfly. But it's been freezing cold outside here in Southern California. You know it's the end of the world when it... <laughs> it's this stupid cold. So we had to bring the caterpillars in the house. <laughs> And I Instagrammed last night this caterpillar. He's in the kitchen, and he's on a branch, and he's moving like this. But I know these things, and he's looking to Jay, it's called. He's looking to Jay. He's, he's done. He's getting ready to turn. Transformation's coming. He mo oh, I'm out of time. God bless you guys. It was nice. <laughs> I'll, end. I'll end. Here it is. So go to, go to my Instagram. You see him going like this. And he pauses for a moment, and he arches his back, and he's looking up. He's looking for a, a branch. Why? He's going to go to a spot, and he's going to anchor. It's silk. He's going to anchor with silk, his back legs. Then he's going to hang, and he's going to go into the position of a J. <laughs> J for Jesus. J, J. Anyway, he'll go into a J. He'll go into a J. And for anywhere from 14 to 20 days, the inside of that thing turns into a liquid, and it liquefies, and it's swirling inside there. You hold a light up to it, and you see this transformation taking place, and then you walk out, your, you walk out in the morning, and you're going to see him come out of that thing, and a monarch butterfly is the most unique butterfly in all the world, migrates 3,000 miles, the most, most furthest dis, uh, 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 migratory insect in the world, and it's beautiful. Flies different, acts different, eats different. It's remarkable. It's poisonous until it's transformed. It can't fly until it's released from its body. It doesn't go into the shape of a J until it's done walking on earth. God bless you, ladies and gentlemen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Hey, thanks for watching Real Life YouTube channel. And if this message has been a blessing to you, then just click the subscribe button because we'd love to keep you up to date on what we're teaching on and what's coming next. And if you'd like to help us increase our reach in getting out these messages to a greater audience, then you can help support us by becoming a partner by simply clicking on the link in the description box below. So listen, we wanna thank you for helping us get the word of God out to the ends of the earth.